Hey, how's it going, everybody? My name is Greg Brown from Foundry, and in the modeling segment here, we're speaking with William Vaughn and John Bavaresco. I'm, I'm sure they almost need no introduction. They're both prolific in the Moto community, but um, let's get a little bit of bio on, on each of these, these amazing guys. Uh, William, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm sure. I'm, I'm currently the senior 3D production manager at New Balance, uh, where I manage a team of amazingly talented artists. Uh, I also contribute to Pixel Fondue, which is a, a community site with uh, tutorials and source files and things like that, and uh, and also the owner of Pushing Points, where uh, where I create um, training material and uh, and add-ons like kits for for Moto. Awesome, and uh, John. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Wow, hard to follow and act like that. Um, <laughs> I'm actually a, uh, an instructor at the Academy of Art University up in San Francisco, actually an online instructor, so I am located in Southern California. And uh, I teach a moto course uh, for the School of Industrial Design at the, uh, at the Academy. And uh, along with that, I have my own uh, uh, website, um, Moto Methods for Designers, which uh, kind of uh, outlines how to uh, build shoes right now. Uh, so it's going to be expanded to other types of uh, industrial design sort of products, but it will, it, it's very uh, design centric. So uh, those two things are keeping me pretty busy right now. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, great. So as I mentioned, this is the modeling segment, but it's a little bit more than modeling. Uh, we are going to be talking a little bit about modeling, a little bit about UVs, um, performance relating to both and also a little bit at the end about some of our new PBR features as well. Um, so, uh, you know, you know, William, you, you mentioned like a uh, very, you kind of, you, you're great at understating your impacts. Uh, you, you know, we know you work for, for New Balance, but I mean, I learned from you many years ago. I think almost anybody in the Moto community has learned from you over the past couple of years. You're, you're kind of prolific at this point. Um, what do you do outside of Moto? I mean, that's the thing. Like, we all see you post videos all the time, you know, day after day. And I mean, do you do anything else but 3D? Uh, as far as uh, work-wise or, <laughs> no, uh, or? Not work-wise. Like, what, what, who, who's, who's William outside of, of his profession? So outside of, um, of the, the stuff I do on this uh, box and, then, you know, behind these monitors, um, I have a, a real passion for running. Uh, so I do um, ultra running, which is uh, distances longer than a, a standard marathon. Uh, and recently, I've, I've uh, gotten the hiking bug. So I'm, uh, I'm spending uh, more time uh, doing hiking and with the plan to, uh, to hike the Appalachian Trail. So that's my, my a future goal. So between between all the um, you know the work I do at New Balance, the work I do with uh, Pixel Fondue and Pushing Points, and then all of the training, uh, my my days are pretty full. <laughs> yeah, there's kind of a legend that you only sleep four hours a day. Uh, if if I can, yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, fair enough. Okay, um, well, uh, you know, you made a video for us uh, going over some of the modeling features. And so I'm going to go ahead and pop that video on up for us. And let's just hop on over here. Building on the release of Moto 14 from earlier this year, which was packed with some great workflow improvements, version 14.1 continues to enhance Moto's powerful toolset. I'd like to quickly share some of the new additions to the modeling tool set that are already improving the speed at which I create assets in Moto. The Polygon Bevel tool continues to receive enhancements for both direct and procedural versions of the tool. One key addition is the auto weld attribute, which corrects the long-standing overlapping geometry issue that occurs when beveling complex corners. Toggling the auto weld option on will automatically weld the vertices that would otherwise cause the edges to overlap. The additional weld range attribute enables you to control the range the welding takes place. Also new to the polygon bevel tool are the falloff controls, which enable you to decouple the shift and inset values when using a vertex weight map. To demonstrate these new options, I'll add a polygon bevel mesh op to this mesh item. Then I'll add a weight map falloff to the tool pipe. 
I'll increase the shift and inset attributes and deactivate the group polygons option. We can see that by default, both the shift and inset attributes are being affected by the weight map falloff. With the new options, I can deactivate either shift or inset for finer control of how the weight map is applied to the tool. As someone who uses weight maps in most of my modeling work, these options are sure to get a lot of use. Edge Chamfer also received a new option for extending boundary edges. With the extend boundary attribute active, you can extend the selected boundary edges outward, similar to edge extend with the local attribute active, but in many cases it produces better results. As with the new polygon bevel enhancements, this option is available for both the procedural and direct modeling versions of Edge Chamfer. Another enhancement that has proven to be a big time saver is the one added to the polygon make command. Simply select two continuous edges that share a common endpoint vertex and then run the command. It'll automatically create a fourth vertex producing a quad polygon. With additional enhancements to UV creation and manipulation and more, 14.1 offers a variety of improvements to modeling, making Moto that much more powerful as well as flexible when creating assets. Okay, well, thanks uh, again for making another awesome video for us that is incredibly concise and goes through a lot of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So first off, off, bevel auto welds. Um, you know, what, 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 is that, uh, um, what does that offer for you uh, in your day-to-day? -day? Well, so, for me, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I'm just, I'm not no, go ahead. What are you talking about? Um, for me, for my students, that's a godsend. I can't tell you how many times that uh, during one of the tutorials that they're going through, I'll get an email or something that says that shows me that they're, they've got these uh, cross ups in the corners where they beveled and, uh, and I instruct them, okay, you have to literally select those vertices and weld them and, uh, you know, merge them together as one. And uh, so, you know, it walked them through that uh, step. It's not that difficult, but just the fact that we can now just kind of circumvent that whole issue is huge to me. Yeah, awesome. anytime, yeah, anytime you can can take steps out of a process. So, uh, you know, um, that has been a long, long running issue. But for people that have been, you know, been modeling for years, you like like John said, you just select the the verts and you merge them and you move on and and all is well. But uh, for a new user. Uh, all they see is broken geometry and, and, and they don't know what's going on. And so being able to, to have that option uh, will hopefully, um, you know, speed up the learning process. And for, for people that, that already know it, will just allow them to skip those steps. Yeah. And, you know, for us who, who've been you know, at this for a long time, uh, you know, we, we've got all these little workarounds and you don't really think twice about them until something comes along that you don't have to do that work around anymore. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a real blessing. <laughs> Definitely. And I've been wanting that for a long time, actually. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think we all have, um, you know, Taz worked on this feature, the, the amazing uh, Taz for those of you in the moto community who have, have heard his name banded around for quite a long yeah. time. Yeah. Um, he's made basically most of the modeling tools in moto from the very beginning. And he's absolutely brilliant. We went on a real initiative um, to try and correct um, our bevel tools to improve our bevel tools and also um, you know when we talk about bevel you're really talking about edge beveling and also polygon beveling and vertex beveling and yeah. one of our biggest weak points was the edge beveling side of things and so we replaced that with chamfer the other big challenging one was auto weld and this was a, a lot of effort on Taz's part so really want to give Taz props on what an amazing job he's done on that and just like all of our bevel tools um, you will continue to see additional updates as we go forward. Yeah, yeah. So very cool. Um, and uh, went the polygon bevel with fall off. Um, again, that was uh, an awesome example you showed. Uh, you know, usually when people um, just do like kind of like a spiky bevel, like un unwelded polygons on, on a surface for hair, I don't like it, but I love this. And I think yeah, that it really yeah. speaks to that, that, that tool, William. Is this something you would actually would use for characters in this manner that you're showing in the video? Um, I, I've, I've actually used something similar for, not for a, a, a human character, but for uh, reptiles and, and creatures. Um, like I said in the video, um, anybody that knows me, I'm like a weight map fanatic. I use weight mm -hmm. maps for modeling, for texturing, for rigging, uh, for animation, you, you name it. It's... Um, they're, they're, vertex maps are, are I think, um, something that's easily overlooked. And um, when you have these nice little additions that, that, you know, enhancements that keep coming, it makes it that much easier because what I would have had to do before is um, two bevel operations, one for, for shift 
And uh, well, actually in, in the second one, I wouldn't do a bevel. I would have had to scale with local on mm -hmm. in order to achieve the, the same effect. So um, being able to do it all in one go and have it be interactive. Uh, I, I specifically chose uh, to go the procedural route with that example, um, just because, uh, uh, you know, to show that not only do you have those options, but you, um, you can always go back and change it later. You can always go and tweak. I mean, the, the, the beauty of, of mesh ops and procedural modeling is being able to yeah. go back and, and make those changes later. Right. Yeah, and even with, with direct modeling workflows, uh, you know, one of the things I'm a big proponent of is the, the combination of action centers uh, with fall offs. And you can use vertex maps, you know, along with that as well. And, you know, when you, when, anytime you talk about any, uh, any modeling in Moto, all these things need to be included. And it was one of the things that we're, uh, you know, very forward thinking about with Moto was, uh, the ease of access and inclusion to vertex maps and in very simple modeling tasks. So we want to keep continuing to take that further. And uh, as kind of a, a further point on that, the next feature that we were showing was the edge extend for edge chamfer. And you can see that it produces much better results. Um, but you know, this is uh, just adding functionality to our new edge chamfer tool to make sure that we reach parity with the edge bevel functionality, um, but also while dramatically improving, um, you know. Yeah, that uh, was to me, again, uh, a two-step process, you know, do an edge extend, then yeah. modify that edge uh -huh. to where you needed it to be, where you wanted it to be. And now that's just all built into one function. So that's yeah. great. Yeah, and you don't have to, what's nice is with the, um, with the edge extend route, you have to make sure that you go to, you know, turn on the local attribute, make sure that you click and drag the correct handle. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of things that you have to do right to make that process work. And as we saw in that, it was a simple example, but I wanted to make it easy to, to, to see the difference. Um, now you only have one handle that you have to, to worry about. Um, and you will end up with better results. So it's a, you know, it's, it's a multiple win there. Awesome. That's, awesome. you know, that's awesome. helpful for me too. When I, when I'm doing a, creating a tutorial for the students, there's a lot of ways to do one thing, you know, to, to uh, maybe shift a polygon or bevel polygon or, or even do, um, a push or something like that. But, um, and, and a lot of times I will, have them do the same function on the same model or, or different functions on the same model to achieve the same effect, just so that the student gets used to the different tools. They have, they have a little uh, bit of uh, experience with, with running different tools and s showing how they can actually give you the same result. And something like this, um, whereas I've kind of avoided doing the edge extend on some of them because I know that it's going to be a multi-step process for them mm -hmm. to get the result that I'm wanting to get. But with this, again, this is a, this is a great new feature. Awesome. And uh, I mean, I, I work here, but I think it's a great feature too. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> uh, but I, I think that as, as, as an artist, because this, yeah. this makes it easier for me to work, uh, you know, every single day as well. Uh, we love seeing these features, um, you know, really come to life. Uh, and just to, to point out, um, both William and John are on on various alpha teams behind the scenes. And so I just want to say thanks to both of you on the help you give us on alpha feedback, because every time we complete a feature and we submit it, you know, to our alpha testers, um, we never consider that feature done because the feedback we get um, is very valuable. So it's been that it evolves mm -hmm. because of contributions from alpha testers like yourselves. And uh, finally, in that video, um, we also touched on the um, UV unwrap. Uh, UV well, unwrap I, I and relax. Yeah, just for a, yeah just please for a go. Yeah. You're, you're skipping. You're skipping one that I almost didn't put in the video because it seems so trivial. But just because it seems trivial doesn't mean oh, it's not. Geez, that's the I poly did. make. Yeah. Oh the boy. Polygon no. make command. Yeah. yeah, yeah again, yeah. like there's lots of ways to make a polygon. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's options that you have there, but that's actually a big one because that comes up more times than, than I, I, uh, I, I can remember mm -hmm. the, the fact that you can just select two edges, hit P, uh, the shortcut for, for, um, uh, make polygon and it creates that fourth vert. Like, again, I almost didn't put it in because the average person might see it and go, yeah, that's not a big deal mm -hmm. until you find yourself making polygons. Yeah, uh, and so so uh, I, I, sorry for interrupting, but I, no. I had to no, 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 no. That's absolutely because I do right. think the average person that's that's used to doing that, I think they'll be excited about that. 
No, that's great. No, it, thank you for interrupting because I, I went on and I thought about it, but I went on my own little, my own little monologue and skipped over it. It's, it's amazing. Uh, and I, I think it's probably ex- especially valuable to you because you, you come from Lightwave. And I remember the first model I made in Lightwave, <laughs> I did it from a tutorial where you had to lay out points and then yeah. you had to select them all, you know, what counterclockwise <laughs> and hit P and make it. And so, you know, we come from this background where we had to make every single polygon that went into a model. And yeah. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I'm like, I just want to select three, make that fourth point for me. And so it's one yeah. that we're, we're happy we were able to add. Um, <laughs> it adds a lot of, lot of value and it's kind of essential for a sub modeler. So yeah. thank you for bringing that up. Absolutely. Yeah. No, no worries. All right. Yep, but I did yep. sneak in, it was short in the video, I did sneak in what you were about to talk about, which is the, the, like the UV Relax that's now part of um, the procedural modeling aspect for Mesh Ops. Um, yep. I just wanted to put that in there so that we had it as a t- talking point mm-hmm. because we've had, uh, I didn't want it to come across as that Moto didn't have, you know, unwrapping tools and relaxing tools and that kind of stuff because UVing in Moto, uh, though I'm always saying that I really don't like UVing, but it is... Uh, it's not painful in Moto to, to, to UV map, but, um, but we've had them. those features. Yeah. We've had unwrap, we've had relax, yeah. and yeah. they're great. But the fact that now um, they're they're procedural, um, I think I think that that was worth. Uh, you know, uh, along with that, you know, UV mapping has always kind of been this black art, you know, to a lot of people where they just kind of. They don't really know how to do an unwrap or how, how to flatten an object. And they just kind of poke at some buttons, throw some sliders and hope for the best. You know, <laughs> if that doesn't work, change the settings and try it again. But I think with Moto, they've really done a great job at, uh, at kind of demystifying a lot of that. And, uh, you know, and a lot of times for me, and, and this speaks to some of my students too, is that uh, they'll go and try something and it won't work. And then I'll just suggest, well, why don't you try uh, doing a unwrap and de- try these settings or just ratchet up this setting and, uh, and suddenly it works. You know, and they can see it in real time, actually, in a lot of cases when you're doing an unwrap and you just change that iteration slider and suddenly the whole thing just kind of flattens out and, and behaves, you know. Yeah, so, or even and, understanding how what what sequence of of UV tools. Like most of my demos on our UV tools, like people always respond well to them. But it's important to clarify, like, look, we it's we want to give you as much flexibility as possible. So there's a lot of tools in our UV tool set, right? right. Um, but and it's I about think, understanding how you go through that sequence to really get like a nice map. Yeah, right. And I really think it's important for them to understand what a nice map is, mm-hmm. what the point of UV mapping is. You know, for mm-hmm. for patterns and and the images that uh, have to wrap around your model and uh, to be able to, uh, you know, use the tools to control that. I mean, even if they have to go in and, and uh, shove a few verts around with the element move tool and things like that, it's very, very helpful to be able to yeah. do that in, in UV. Yeah, yeah, I, always, yeah. I was just going to say, I always tell people, anytime you invest in uh, the UV process, will will pay for itself 20 times over when you're texturing. If you take shortcuts during the UV phase, you're going to pay for it when you're trying to, you know, to, to have a one-to-one for the text you're doing, especially with the, um, the material work we do at New Balance where yeah. um, you can tell if something is stretched or skewed or, mm-hmm. you know, you have some kind of overlay graphic and it's supposed to be a, a straight line or a nice smooth curve and you get a kink. So anytime you can invest, you know, early on in the UV process, it, it does pay off. Yeah, absolutely. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people make these gorgeous, complex models. And they're like, I've got to do UVs now for a while. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like, all you had to do was just do a, a basic unwrap. It didn't need to be pretty. Just make sure you've got your, 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 yeah. your, your, your edges yeah. that you, where you want it to split. So you, yeah. now you have those sitting in there to go and do UVs. Either. So that's kind of a tip is, do your UVs as you are working on the model. Yeah. <laughs> well, and if you do that, yeah. if, you, if you UV early on, you can take advantage of that UV map during the modeling phase. I do that all the time. Oh, absolutely. That's a good, that's a good mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You can actually use the UV editor to do selections of, yes. of parts of your models that would yep. be very difficult to select otherwise. And you can yeah. convert UV map data to weight data and then use the weight data as a fall off for tools. It's like, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's just awesome. 
there we go. So, so I'm kind of picturing unless like, are we going to see even more videos now? <laughs> yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. This conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of our UV tools. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of cool plans ahead, you know, for the, that tool set as well that we're looking forward to showing you in the future. Um, so you'd be seeing more there and, uh, our new unwrap and relax tool is an example of how you combine two tools to the, two, two tools together because it's an unwrap and a relax and a sequence to create a really nice hilt. And uh, on that, let's go ahead and move on over more formally to the UV tools and John Bavaresco, who uh, made a couple videos for us there. Before we do that, John, um, can you can you tell us a little bit more about yourself outside of your professional life, outside of Modo? Well, um, I do nothing. No, I'm just really wow. <laughs> no, I uh, uh, actually right now with this whole. Uh, 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 coronavirus thing going on don't uh, get out as much as I had wanted to and would like to uh, actually and I think that's true for a lot of people but um, I do like to cycle I have a nice uh, uh, specialized bike gee oh, nice. why would I buy a specialized bike <laughs> because I was there uh, but uh, anyway uh, that's a very cool shop uh, actually but uh, I do have a nice bike that I'd be like to ride uh, when I haven't chance to uh lately it's been kind of warm but uh, uh i do get out every once in a while and uh, do like to cycle and um what else right now we are refinishing our kitchen cabinets <laughs> as as one of those chores you know and i have to say of all the stores that are actually making money in this time of uh you know lockdown as it were it's got to be those home depot stores and Lowe's and because I go in there and they are always crowded <laughs> yeah yeah it's pretty much a rave yeah, yeah yeah it's like the place to go right now. yeah well it's so, like yeah. everybody's doing home improvements now so <laughs> oh, yeah totally yeah. totally guilty I'm planning on tearing down walls um but anyway yeah. <laughs> cool all right so let's go but ahead anyway. and, and yeah let's take a look at this uh UV Relax uh, um, uh, mesh shop, actually. So, because we implemented UV Relax as a mesh shop for our procedural modeling tools. And uh, it was a tool that is, of course, very much needed for our mesh shops. So, let me go ahead and switch on over. Moto 14.1 has made some vast improvements over the speed and efficiency of the UV Relax tool. In this example, we'll show a UV relax being performed in Moto 14.0. Set to an adaptive mode with 3000 iterations, you can see that this can be quite a lengthy process. In which case, you might want to go get yourself a cup of coffee, maybe grab a few cookies, you know, sit down and relax for a little bit. And here we can see that in Moto 14.0.2, about a minute later, the UV relax is completed. Now let's switch over to 14.1.0 and use the exact same settings with a UV relax of adaptive mode and 3000 iterations. But don't go too far because you won't have time to do much of anything except maybe sharpen a pencil. And we give it about 10 seconds or so and it's done. Moto 14.1 UV relax. Okay, love it. We did have uh, John focus on some of the more performance related aspects, and but UV Relax uh, as a mesh op is the new aspect uh, in 14.1. But Taz, again, Taz is our modeling and our UV tools, and a five fold speed up on UV Relax is great. Uh, in particular, with you using 3,000 iterations. I would never do yeah, that. Right. Right. Well, now you I can. Really I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You, you remember yeah. Steve Worley, um, he, he was a great uh, programmer, uh, but he used to say, don't be afraid of numbers. You know, just ratchet that thing up as high as you want to go. <laughs> and so I said, okay, I remember that, that little piece of advice. But yeah, so now you can ratchet things way up and, and uh, you know, let them go. And mm -hmm. that was, by the way, that was a, uh, a CAD model of a mouse. And so you can see that the geometry is not really ideal. And I wanted to use something that was a little more, uh, I want to say challenging as far as, you know, uh, edge flows and things like that go. So, uh, yeah. 
So a lot of people, I get uh, students actually coming back to me, you know, after the course, asking how they can work with uh, uh, CAD models, you know, and UV mapping. And sometimes, uh, you know, the best advice is to retopo it, and sometimes you can actually work with them. So it's, it's uh, you know, depends on the model itself. But that one uh, was uh, a little, I thought was a little challenging for doing UV Relax, but, uh, but it works. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And William, you know, um, you, you were, you're bringing this up as a mashup. Um, and of course the performance uh, enhancements do apply as a mashup mesh up as well as for direct modeling. Uh, what effect has this had for you and your team using procedural modeling in Moto? So, um, so, you know, even down to the, the stitch tool is a procedural tool. Um, I mean, we use that day in and day out. That was a massive game changer. And any, anything that we can add to that. So we, we're always looking at ways that we can take advantage of mesh ops uh, for what we would normally do direct modeling for. Um, and with the performance enhancements that we're seeing like that. So I, I actually had a, a quick question, which was, um, was that enhancement tied to anything other than uh, Relax? Um, uh, like, so, so the changes that were made to UV Relax to, to get that speed increase, is it tied to anything else in, in Moto? It's, it's, it's specific to UV Relax. Now, I mean, who knows? I mean, I, there may be some tie because a lot of the, those tools that Taz works, works on have a lot of connections to other tools. Um, yeah. But my, my understanding is just UV Relax, yeah. Okay, because I know that that's been a focus uh, for the last few builds um, of, of performance, of, of working in areas of, of Moto and seeing where we can get faster and and uh, you know, and optimize, optimize things. So I, I just wasn't sure when I saw that that uh, speed increase. I, I I wasn't sure if I could go, you know, test it in other areas as well to see if uh, if there were benefits there. Yeah, it was partially motivated by the uh, the unwrap relax tool, the combination of the two tools that we did in the in the last release. Uh, because the moment you combine those two tools together, where one runs right after the other, essentially. Uh, you start to notice that relax is a lot slower than unwrap. And, you know, we oftentimes, uh, you know, throw something in Taz, say, Hey, do you think you can make this any faster? We really don't know. And I, it's, it's amazing how many times he comes back and, and he's got like a five fold enhancement, uh, <laughs> you know? And so, yeah, Taz, uh, we can't, we can't say enough amazing things about Taz. All right then. Um, and so let's move on to the next performance enhancement. So the next area of performance that I'd like to show is remove edge capabilities. So you oftentimes have to remove lots of, lots of edges on models, particularly ones that you import. And so uh, we were able to improve the speed of that significantly. And so I'll go ahead and just share that video. Occasionally, I'll get a uh, CAD file or some scanned data to work with. And uh, in this case, I have a helmet scan. And uh, I want to do a retopology of this uh, particular model. And in doing so, I oftentimes try to reduce the data set that I have to work with by uh, reducing the number of edges. So by doing a uh, diagonal edge selection, I can maintain the integrity of the object. But as you can see, that's quite a number of edges. I've got over 107,000 edges selected. And uh, it can be quite an arduous process. Oftentimes, I've been known to uh, get in my car and go out for coffee and come back, go back up to my office, sit down and uh, wait for it to finish up. But I won't keep you in suspense here, so I'll just uh, speed forward and uh, about five minutes and boom, five minutes, three seconds, it's done. Well, let's take a look at Moto 14.1 and see how it fares. So I'll do the same edge selection and same number of edges. And let's go ahead and move over to the edge toolbox and click on remove edges, keep verts, and boom. No time to go get coffee here. So 2.64 seconds. Well done, gentlemen. Well done. <laughs> Okay. Um. <laughs> you can't even say night and day different there. Like that's beyond night and day different. Wow. 
Uh, yeah, before we talk a little bit more about it, I just want to clarify, when John sent us that video, we were just blown away because we have a quick clip for that. It's done. It's You'll be seeing it only release yeah. 14.1. We got about a four to five full speed up, but that's on assets that were created in Modo and that weren't really all that dense. And then you show us this and I, you know, I did the math quickly. It was like something around 150 times <laughs> speed yeah. up. Yeah. Well, and yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a again, great example um, also because it's uh, it, it's the type of stuff that, that you would use uh, in production. You know, it's not that was just, actually, yeah. yeah. That was actually something that came from one of the clients that I, I taught um, that, that uh, um, uh, they had to retopologize. And it was a scan of a helmet. And it was done as a test. They were actually testing out a scanner. It wasn't uh, a proprietary uh, piece of uh, a model or anything like that. But it was uh, just something that they were testing out a new scanner with. And they said, well, can we retopologize this thing? And I said, well, sure, why not? But in doing so, I wanted to clean up the geometry a little bit. And that took a while, <laughs> needless to say, because that was a much earlier version of Moto. But this is, this is like, don't blink or you'll miss it kind of advanced, uh, you know, speed improvement. So, yeah. That, that, that's, it, it, you blew my mind with that video, you know, yeah. like I, I was expecting to see a 5X speed up on a new asset, which is going to be great, you know, but wow, just the whole lot of wow. Uh, and another thing to point out in that video is uh, you select a diagonal. Um, yeah, uh, I think Moto selection tools are something worth discussing a little bit because they are in Incredible! Like I love select boundary. Uh, I love mm -hmm. select uh, by angle. Is another big, big, big one I use yes. on hard surface yeah. models. Yeah. Can you guys speak to that a little bit, or selection tools as a whole? Yeah, I mean, um, even being being able to just convert from uh, one component to the other, convert from polys to edges, convert like something I do uh, on a regular basis is uh, select by material and convert that to a, a poly selection. I mean, yeah. there's a whole list of uh, selection options. But then some of the ones that you use every day, uh, you just don't think about. And the, when, I'm, when I'm teaching, the, the being able to convert between uh, component modes, that to me is a, a massive time saver. Yeah, selection is absolutely core to every modeling process. And the fact that Moto has a lot of ways to select, uh, to select items and, you know, besides being able to swap between selections, you could just go into the uh, stats and yep. uh, go into uh, polygon by type. You can also select uh, under items. Uh, um, if, if you have a CAD model, uh, you oftentimes get parts with that model and uh, people don't realize, Oh, well you go in and actually select the parts that came in with that CAD model. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so there's a ton of different ways that people can select items in, in Moto. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, you know, converting from one uh, uh, item type or um, uh, uh, component type, to another is is huge you know <laughs> yeah sometimes if i have like just a, a nice loop of polys that's like the top of a ridge or something like that and i'm like i need to select the outer edges i'll just you know loop select like the polys on that ridge and then go ahead and convert that to an edge selection right and, and deselect and, loop is, is yeah a cool when a lot of people don't really realize exactly when you whenever anytime you look at moto's uh, interface one of the things you really need to pay attention to is what happens when you hold down control or alt or shift and mm -hmm. these are mm -hmm. modifiers that offer additional tools in the ui and you're going to see that underneath the component modes, they switch for converting between each other. And, uh, and it offers a lot of flexibility. And uh, as far as discoverability, as long as you know about those modifiers, then um, you're going to notice a lot of different things appearing in the UI. You're going to discover a lot more. Yeah, because there's also, there's also select bounds and select boundary for edges. Mm -hmm using the modifier keys, and I use those all the time. Oh, absolutely. No, I mean, those, those are essential. All right. Well, um, let's see. And finally, um, what we're going to talk a little bit about is our new PBR loader, which I am very excited about. Um, a little bit more background on that. This is, I, I have, uh, I, I'm, I'm a big shading guy. I like, I like, I, I, I spend a lot of time doing material work and stuff. And so I've got a, I've got a long list of shader tree features I want. We can't do everything mm -hmm. we want to do, uh, you know, immediately. But one of them that was brought up was the PBR loader. And uh, I was like, yeah, it'd be great if we had this. And one of the people who works here was like, you know what? I've been working on something like that. And that was Ben Holling, who was the head of our QA. 
And then he's basically got the underpinnings already in place. And so we went ahead and did it because then basically had most of it done. And then with help from alpha testers, we kind of refined it into a worthwhile feature of its own. And this is, again, one that you will continue to see um, more um, ease of use capabilities added to it. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Modo 14.1 introduces a new importer for the shader tree, the PBR loader. This powerful feature is designed to optimize importing, organizing, and applying materials from other applications. Its primary functionality lets you quickly load in all related images and automatically sets their effect based on the effect in the name of that image file. Let's take a look at it in action and touch upon the many preference options the PBR Loader has to offer. You can access the PBR Loader from the Texture heading in the main menu, or through the shortcut icon above the shader tree. For an effect to be set automatically on import, you must set your effect definitions first in the PBR Loader Preferences. Each different material base in Modo has its own set of definitions, and you can quickly enable or disable all effects for each base material. The definition you set will establish the word the file name must contain for the PBR loader to recognize it and automatically set the image layer effect you've defined on import. You also have quick control over imported image layers with the various set effects options. There are several variable options that apply to all the imported materials when they are enabled. Create folder will place your material in a material group in the shader tree. Use folder name when used in conjunction with create folder will name the material group after the folder name the material is located in. Create texture locator connects all imported images to one texture image locator. If you want each image layer to have its own texture locator, you can disable this setting. Set normal to no color space will set any image layer with the effect of normal to have no color space set on import. Disabling this setting will see your normal map use the current scene's default color space. Auto set type on rename will update an image layer's effect automatically if you rename the layer to another defined effect. And the Create Material menu lets you automatically create a material layer with the imported image layers. Finally, you can export your PBR loader definitions into a shareable config file. The PBR loader is sure to help you streamline your experience with the shader tree in Modo. Okay, John, it almost looked like you were taking notes during that. <laughs> yeah, that is a huge leap forward. Yeah. Unfortunately, I haven't had a lot of experience with uh, PBR loader and our, you know, uh, PBR shaders and whatnot, Unreal and Unity. But to me, this is really uh, the future of of design presentation, I think, or at least one major branch in, into that area. Now, I know game designers and, and, and uh, game creators are gonna love this, absolutely. But I think for design, which is what I'm focused on, uh, I see that as being a very big step forward. And it's something that uh, I'm hoping to get a little more experience in shortly, as soon as I'm done rebuilding my course here. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about that, really. Um, so. Yeah, yeah before we go any, I'm sorry, go ahead, Wayne. I was just gonna say, we're, we're moving more and more into real-time assets. So, um, so we're, uh, we're ready to welcome any tools like that that are going to make our life easier. Yeah, and it's, it's just, it, it, I, I, actually, there's uh, some videos from a few releases ago that involved a game asset that, you know, was built in Unreal that I had to export from Unreal and then bring in a Modo. And I had to reassign all the textures for that entire level. And I actually got a friend of mine to do it for me, uh, which was kind enough to do. But I mean, that was, I mean, that's some yeah. painful, painful work. And so being able to do this in groups makes life a lot, lot easier. And uh, 
that it was a three minute video. That's I think our longest quick clip for this time around, which uh, I got to say, Laura Ambry does an amazing job with these quick clips. She's been yes. absolutely doing incredible. And if she does a three minute video, that means that everybody else would made it for six minutes. So I don't know. You might have a challenger on brevity. <laughs> William. <laughs> Just give her, give her a couple more releases. She might be, might be knocking at your door. Um, and also Tim Ald, if you noticed, that was the first quick clip that we shown publicly formally. That was a final one as well. Uh, from our docs team um, did the editing and the music and uh, all the sound editing and it, you know it's really up the level of quality that we have for those quick clips so definitely want to note that uh, the amazing work that both those individuals did on that but uh, PBR Loader I am super super excited about that feature it's going to make uh, many game artists in particular um, lives easier yeah yeah Okay, well, um, as far as 14.1 or even the 14 series is concerned, not the 14.2 stuff you guys already know, um, but the rest of people don't. Um, anything else, else you want to point out from 14.1 or 14.0 that has been impactful in your day-to-day? -day? I think um, for, for me, it's just all of the more subtle uh, enhancements to the UI, um, to the shader tree. I'm a big fan of the shader tree, especially um, teaching designers. Moto. Um, I teach a lot of designers Moto and uh, just how similar the shader tree is to Photoshop layers. Yes. Uh, and so any enhancements that you guys are doing there, I mean, the, uh, I get all, I'll be honest, I get all the versions a little uh, mixed up because there's so many of them uh, to, to keep up with. Um, but the, uh, the enhancement to, um, to the groups in the shader tree where you can scale the groups, um, I, was that 14.0? Yes, and that was your suggestion. I, I sent you a doc saying, hey, I'm doing a shader tree enhancements. And you, you, like, I, you reply like 20 minutes later, like, here they all are. And I'm like, this is a doc I had worked on for like a week. And you're like, Bleh. <laughs> Like that one we saw, and we were like, no, we're doing this now. It was, it was but that's a, that's a big one. Like that one could easily be overlooked if you were just looking at a list of features or even uh, like I made a, a short little video about it and I know you guys have a video about it as well. It could be one of those things that you look at and you go, oh yeah, that's, that's neat. But for anybody that's doing a lot of work in that shader tree, working with a lot of um, materials with multiple layers and groups, that's one of my favorite features that, that have, that's come out in a, in a long time just because we do so much material work. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. John? Any, uh, yeah, any, I mean, any, yeah. Uh, kind of uh, riffing off that, um, I do teach in my course uh, a, a module, as it were, a lesson on, on how to shade your products in, in Moto. And we have to go through the very basics of the shader tree, how it works, how it functions. Uh, but a lot of the students, like William said, that are used to uh, Photoshop, they get it right off the bat. They kind of understand how that, how that workflow works. And uh, the enhancements to the shader tree are great. Um, you know, I haven't had an opportunity to really dig into them fully because uh, right now I'm updating the course that I actually did uh, the first time around, which was in Moto, I think it was in 12. And uh, so we, you know, they, they keep the course active for a long time, but now I'm upgrading it to uh, 14. And uh, just the performance enhancements alone are just really amazing. I can tell just, you know, moving stuff around in, in real time uh, in the viewport is just, uh, is amazing, you know. Yeah, um, thank you for bringing that up actually because it's one of the, one of the uh, performance enhancements in 14.1 is just general uh, shader tree enhancements with the, the viewport and, and AVP in, in, in yeah, particular. Yeah. Um, but we, it, it's a hard one to really show off in an apples to apples comparison. You can do a play, play like a playback of an animation, but that's not the same as interaction. So anyway, it's, it's another thing that you will probably have the experience of right. much faster interaction in the shader tree right. while using AVP. And yeah. uh, the shader tree, you know, you both brought up the same thing about the Photoshop layers. Um, you know, it, it, it's hard not to acknowledge that some people find themselves frustrated with the shader tree. And uh, I, I, I myself was one of those people when I came over to Moto and like, like, what is this crazy beast? And I love it now. And we have well, plans on making it more accessible. Well, it's very different from, from any other app that I've mm -hmm. used, uh, any other 3D app that I've used. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think it's one, I, I think it's something Foundry should highlight um, because I do think it sets uh, Moto apart from a lot of the other um, uh, options out there. 
but from a you know just uh, just speaking to a from a training point of view if you if if i'm training somebody that is coming from another 3d program there's a more of a struggle to to kind of wrap their you know wrap their head around the shader tree but if i'm training somebody that's coming from illustrator or photoshop like a, a designer um it's so much easier for me to say okay look in photoshop look at how you have a clipping mask okay well we have uh, we have layer and group masks here and they work pretty much the same way. Um, so, uh, so to me that, that should be something that, that you guys should um, really push and highlight because I think it's easy to overlook uh, yeah. because it's been in, you know, moto since, uh, you know, since the beginning. So. Yeah. And Fair also enough. the fact that uh, people can uh, do iterations of their, their products. In other words, change out materials just by turning them on and off and, you know, layer multiple materials on a single object and just experiment with uh, turning them on and off. Um, uh, that's, that's a, it's an amazing tool. In fact, um, while I was uh, at Honda uh, teaching uh, those guys on one of their sessions, we did the thing where you can actually make a, uh, uh, the, the geometry of the polygons uh, on an object active and, and actually trigger um, different, different shaders on and off. So I, I would, uh, we'd had a car model. We had several car models and I would click and each one was a different, uh, uh, material. And I would click on one and the, the actual big car model in the steam would uh, change to that material and click on another little miniature car model with a different material on it. And the big car model would change to that material. So, I mean, that's just the power of that shader tree and, uh, in, in, in moto in general but yeah and that's how it even tides into the schematic view or node setups because i did the same thing it sounds like we made the same demo um yeah. <laughs> like i made it for vr yeah, yeah, using yeah. command regions right I, yeah i'd create this region, palette yes. and you. command regions where i could click on it and it would swap the material on the car but i was i, I was running animations at the same time oh Basically, wow. i had all these macros that were firing off different things because you could refer reference a macro from a oh wow wow yeah and so it's like it's it like it, it's these moments where you start tying everything together all these different areas in moto together you're like i wonder if i can do this but with this, yeah well that's when this. the thunder happens yeah. you know you just yeah. start to yeah, really yeah. jesus this thing's so amazing you know exactly well we got a lot of uh, a lot of uh, more, you know further shader tree enhancements planned you guys will continue to see those to roll out and i think i think even some really cool ideas on how we can uh you know um, improve the shader tree as it is but also make it easier to understand for people coming from you node know, based setups because one of the things i like about the shader tree is you can tie into a node based setup in fact you just basically have an element in the tree that is in the schematic and whatever you want to do with that, it's going to drop into that one layer in the shader tree. Yeah. People stuff. don't realize that so, the nodes are, exactly. are buildable right from the shader tree mm -hmm. too. I mean, um, uh, again, when I was uh, at uh, one of these shops and we had uh, some people in the class that were very savvy with other assets, with other types of applications, CAD application, they were used to nodes. And when I showed them, oh, well, if you're used to nodes, why don't you do it this way then? And they were just like blown away, you know, that they can, they can actually do that. Uh, so, and they go, now you're talking my language, you know? So you go. they yeah. just connected up everything they needed to connect up, you know? So, in the yeah, I, so yeah. I got to agree. I definitely think we should promote the shader tree itself more uh, on William's point. Um, but to follow up on that, I want to make sure people know that we also understand why people value nodes. And we think we have some yeah. interesting ideas on how yeah. we can, a company it just depends on experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It well, the fact that you can write. Oh, I was just going to say the fact that you can right click on a channel and add it to to the schematic. Um, yep. Yeah. For yeah. just about anything mm -hmm. makes it easy to to kind of live in both worlds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Yep. Or just drag and drop, whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. It's, it's it's usually pretty pretty flexible. Um, so very, very cool. Um, but thank you guys so much for hopping on um, with us today to talk about these new features. Um, you know, and not just for hopping on here, but for being out, you know, our, our very valued alpha testers who help give us features like one of the ones that you mentioned, the scale for scale groups in the shader tree and, uh, and guiding us when we actually present features to you guys on how we can, how we should actually engineer this so that artists can use it. So we really value your contributions and appreciate all the help you provide us with and all the videos and training both of you make is just 
I, I mean, I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to use any adjective to describe it because it would understate. So thank you guys <laughs> so much. My pleasure. All right. Okay. Well, I will see you guys soon and uh, hope you all enjoy 14. All right. Right. Keep the good stuff coming. <laughs>